welcome to the Healing Broken Families podcast. I'm Barbara LaPointe, and I host Healing Conversations Around Divorce, Parental Alienation, and High Conflict Personalities. Today, I am delighted to host Dr. Eddie Caparucci. Caparucci. Did I say that right? You did say it right, Caparucci. I got a good blush going on that one. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Likewise. Let me read your bio because it's important. Dr. Eddie Caparucci is a Christian counselor and coach certified in treating problematic sexual behaviors. He's worked with professional athletes and television personalities among his clients over the many years, but he is the creator of the inner child model for treating problematic sexual behaviors. This is a unique approach that focuses on on identifying unresolved child pain points and teaching individuals how to process emotional distress in healthy ways. His treatment has been endorsed by many leaders in the field, and he's also the author of several books, including Going Deeper, How the Inner Child impacts your sexual addiction and why men struggle to love. Um, I had the pleasure of pulling a statistic because it's great to know, have a context, like why might this conversation be important? And I wasn't surprised to learn that 40 million US adults regularly visit pornography websites and 10% of those adults admit to having um, an addiction to internet pornography. So I thought we might begin, if it's okay with you, by asking you to define an, an addiction, whether it's a sexual addiction or a pornography addiction, because this is a big, big, relevant problem in culture and society today. It's prevalent. All right. Yeah, and I think, Barbara, it's a great place to start because we look at addictive behaviors and people are always asking, like, you know, so what, when do you consider it a problem? Well, you consider it a problem when it starts to spill over into other areas of your life. You know, some people can drink, they can go out, they can have a couple of drinks and they're fine. Nothing ever goes wrong. There are other people, however, they, they they consume alcohol and it winds up where they it interferes with their work or their school or their relationship. And it's the same thing here with sex and pornography, that it spills over into those other facets of a person's life causing problems. Um, leads me to just ask, and I'm curious, like, is pornography addictive just by its nature? Not by its nature. It depends on, again, how a person is viewing pornography. Okay. Mm -hmm. You threw out that statistic there that that demonstrated that there's a lot of people who who look at porn. However, a large majority of them may look at pornography once a month. It may be just something they casually do. However, someone who has an addiction to pornography is looking at porn four, five times a week, maybe every day, maybe multiple times a day. And with that, sometimes masturbating, or sometimes that I've heard, you know, cases of people six or seven times a day masturbating. Now, that is a major problem because it's interfering with a lot of the rest of your life, as you you can imagine. Now, not all sex addictions are that severe, but that is one example. The other aspect of pornography, because what it does, it produces this sense of stimulation. And with the stimulation, what happens when we become highly stimulated, the brain produces neurochemicals, the pleasure enhancing chemicals, basically serotonin and dopamine. But dopamine is the one we focus on when it comes to uh, addiction. But the body naturally produces that. When you start looking, when you have sex or you're looking at pornography or engaging in sex, you're raising the level of dopamine to standards that are much higher than what the body 
produces. And then over time, what will happen is the brain will start craving that amount of dopamine, looking for the constant hit. The same thing, very similar to someone who does suffer a drug addiction or an alcohol addiction or really any other kind of addiction. Even an addiction to our telephone or cellular? You could have, there's addiction to almost everything if you think about it. And that's a great one. How many, I think more and more people are becoming addicted to their phone. They have to be constantly checking it. They have to be looking to see, you know, have I gotten any, you know, uh, hits on my social media or whatever it may be. Uh, We're looking at people binging on television. Okay, for hours and hours at a time. There are people who even from an exercise standpoint, who could exercise five to six, maybe eight hours a day. Again, obsessive beyond. And of course, work. There are people who are workaholics. And what that is, again, is another form of an addiction. Yes, I agree with you. You can be addicted to absolutely anything on the planet, from working out to sex to to your iPhone, absolutely. But th- when we look at addictions, and let's maybe let's focus on sexual addiction. And kudos for us for being brave to talk about it, because sometimes these things just are not spoken about enough. Um, 40, 40 million U.S. people visit pornography sites, and we also, just generally speaking, I know that. Young men, boys, learn about sex, unfortunately, through pornography. And Uh, and that's growing among little girls now, too. Girls are starting to learn about sex through pornography, which is a really bad thing. It's bad for either of them. Yeah. Especially with girls, because they're being taught something that's just totally up there. They're being taught it's okay to be objectified. That's the problem with girls. But little boys are being taught it's okay to objectify little girls. And that is a recipe for disaster. Yes, it, it's, it really is. And I think that that right there is why this podcast was, is really important and this conversation is really important. But, okay, so how does this begin? Um, because I know that we are going to look through this through the lens of our inner child and inherited family trauma, like, because we don't grow up thinking, I want to, I'm going to be addicted to porn. Um, And I would suggest to, I'm not an expert on this. So correct me if I'm wrong, but if you're a woman and you're dating a man and and sometimes they'll openly tell you that they're, they watch pornography that I would suggest that is a red flag. I would agree with you a hundred percent. I think it's a red flag too. Uh, Because, again, the person most likely also learned that it's okay to objectify, you know, people. They don't see people, they see objects. Uh, That's a bad thing that we see. But to go back to your point of where does it all begin, you know, I think when it comes to addictive behaviors, especially when it comes to something like a sex addiction, I think there's three components. Uh, One is the uh, inability to deal with unresolved childhood pain point. We have, all of us have suffered in some way because none of us have had that childhood that had been scarred free, some worse than others. But yet in many cases, we were not taught how to handle those crises, how to resolve them. So what we did, we just repressed them. We push them away and pretend they never existed. That leads you to the second issue, and that is the inability to sit with emotional discomfort. The fact that we can't sit with our pain, what that does, we learn at a very young age that we're going to run away from it. We got to learn to escape. I don't want to think about it. That's what a child you know, does. It's like, I don't want to think about this pain. So I'm going to escape too much television, too much food, you know, too much, you know, in their own head, fantasy, you know, the list goes on and on. And you take that into your teen year and your adult years. And so now you have somebody who I, I call them runners. Life becomes a little difficult. I feel some emotional distress. And so therefore, I immediately just run off to find a way to forget about that 
and to soothe myself. And then the third aspect is the fact that in many cases, we have people who are emotionally undeveloped. When it came to those critical stages of childhood development, trust, empathy, learning to sit with pain, you know, just keep going down the line, the thing we needed to learn so that we could be emotional beings, we weren't given that guidance, we weren't given that direction for many different reasons. So therefore, we're emotionally undeveloped. And with that, you know, you know what it's like, Barbara, when you're coaching, right? If, if you're going to live your life based on your emotions versus rational thinking, you're going to make a lot of bad decisions. And, and that's what we see here. Because again, the whole idea is more along the lines of, I need comfort. I want comfort. And I don't want anything that is going to distract me from that. It's kind of a self-soothing uh, driver, isn't it? That's exactly what it is. It is a self- we, we learn those coping mechanisms, like the coping mechanism of, I'm not going to think about this pain. I'm going to just ignore it. And then I go find something to soothe myself. And what it does, it helps you forget about that pain for a little while until you're done. And then you come back to it. Right. It's still there waiting for you. Always. Now you mentioned pain points, unresolved pain points along, along your childhood. Um, are you referring to unresolved trauma? that was experienced in childhood? I'm talking about trauma and neglect. Okay, so it's not, yeah, it doesn't have to be, and again, you know how we divide trauma up into big T trauma, you know, major things, there's uh, physical abuse, sexual abuse, you know, emotional abuse. Then we have the little traumas that happen. But there's also the neglect part. And the neglect part falls more in line with what happens in a family where we're supposed to be taught how do we emotionally bond and connect with each other. And that doesn't happen because parents are probably either too preoccupied with, the, with themselves, their work, whatever. Maybe there's a, a sibling who has special needs or is a troubled uh, child and the parents have to throw all their effort into that kid instead of the others. There's many different things that could go on. A parent parent could be suffering from their own problems, such as depression or anxiety or alcoholism, some kind of addiction. So therefore, that child's not getting the nurturing and the care that they need. And that could be just as destructive as any kind of trauma that happens. And then take it outside of the house and now start talking about dealing with our peers, dealing with other authority figures, dealing with just events and circumstances that happen, okay? Everybody make the swim team except you. No one, you know, you're the only one of your friends, of your five good friends who doesn't make that swim team when you're 10 years old. And it's devastating. And you go home and talk to you, you say something to your parents. And, they, and you know, dad says, hey, there's always next year. Don't worry about it. <laughs> you know, there's no one. How do you deal with this emotional distress? Don't worry about it. Just, you know, next year. Okay, fine. I'll forget about it. But you don't. It's still there. It lingers underneath the surface. Because, again, the idea that goes with that is probably something along the lines of, I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. I don't measure up. I'm not as good as they are. I'm inferior. All those things. And now you start building upon that and building upon that. You find different events that happened in your childhood that you think, ooh, that reinforces that idea that I don't measure up. It really doesn't. Mm -hmm. But then again, if a child who's more emotionally based in their thinking than cognitively based, they go right there. And so now you start building up all these negative narratives about ourselves. And we don't want to live with those negative narratives. So we find ways, coping mechanisms to deal with that. Fascinating. And so you're, what I hear you saying is that inner child work is, is one way that we can go back to those frozen, unresolved, big T, little T traumas. 
Yes. And, it, and find a pathway to healing. Correct. In my, in my book, Going Deeper, How the Inner Child Impact Your Sexual Addiction, and you could actually cross out sexual, and you could put, you could just leave it as addiction. All right. Or you could cross it out and you could say how it impacts my destructive behavior, because it really deals with all of that. Um, what I did was I identified nine different children. And that was based on my work with men who are coming into my office who are dealing with these addictive behaviors. And what it did, they all surrounded various, again, negative narratives. Like, for example, there's the need for affirmation or the unnoticed child in one of them, the need for control, the child who grew up in a very chaotic environment and doesn't know what to do with this chaos. So therefore they start to become a perfectionist and learning how to put everything in order. There's the bored child, because boredom also brings with it a sense of emotional discomfort. These kids grow up not having a lot of activities or things to do or friends, and they don't even learn how to make friends. So now as an adult, anytime they feel this sense of boredom kicking in, immediately they're off engaging in whatever sexual uh, behavior they may engage in. So again, there were a total of nine of them that you know are associated with unresolved childhood pain points. So when, when we talk about these unresolved pain points in our childhood, um, it makes me want to just get a little bit clearer on what, what the inner child is, because it's a term that most people have heard generally inner child work, my inner child. But I was just wondering who he or she is, where she lives, when she comes out to talk with I'm, us. I'm so glad you brought that up <laughs> because my, my, version of the inner child is a little bit different than most others. Most other people talk about, you know, connecting with your child, bonding with your child, comforting that child. All of that is good. But when I look at our unresolved childhood pain points, and again, especially things like within the trauma area, those things never fully go away. I don't care how much work you do. I don't care how much counseling you get. Those things are scars. Now, hopefully, the work that we do desensitizes them greatly so that we're not, you know, bombarded or haunted by them every day. However, there are those things called triggers that are out there, and we will get triggered and it will take us right back to that, that place. And that is where our inner child is. Our inner child is locked in a time warp, anywhere from maybe the age of four to 13, 14. And he or she is surrounded by all the various negative events that we went through. So therefore, if something happens in our life today, a negative event, that child reaches into its storage unit and pulls out something that seems very similar to what just happened. And so therefore, now subconsciously within us, while we may be troubled by that event that occur, occurred today, our intensity of discomfort increases as the inner child is rumbling underneath the surface. So now it becomes, ooh, this might be too much for me to handle. And instead of processing through the pain, we just sit and we run away. So that's what the kid is. So with, with my approach, the inner child model, it's about identifying one, what are those core emotional triggers that activate your kid? So you could be very aware of those. And then two, when it does happen, I'm going to sit with that child and I'm going to process that pain with them. I'm going to process, I'm going to, we're going to say, yes, I remember when something like this happened when I was younger. Yes, I do. But then where we go, if we say, okay, I feel, 
okay, you know what? I feel like I've been dismissed. Something happened and I feel dismissed. The kid grabs something and it shows I feel dismissed. But I have to now move to what is real. Because what I feel versus what is real can be two very, very different things. Especially if it's your inner child emotion. So therefore, I tell the kid, look, I'm going to go and I'm going to use my wife's mind to think about this and process it. And instead of just running away, we're going to ultimately come up with a healthy conclusion of how we should handle it. Okay, beautiful, healthy conclusion. Um, well, I'm imagining that process, going through that process with you and how much courage and awareness it might take to enter into a process like that and come to your office like that. So it, it, it makes me want to back up a little bit because um, I don't know if I asked you, but what is so bad about a pornography addiction? Because what I imagine is that there's a lot of men who go untreated or women that go, that go untreated for this addiction and think it's not a big deal that I watch pornography every day. In fact, maybe they say to the person they're dating, if it's a problem for you, maybe it's your problem. I like it. I, uh, I find it stimulating and that's what I want to do period. Yep. Um, so how do you get from there to the awareness that you're going to go into an inner child recovery? Well Process. Well, well, first and foremost, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make them, and in most cases, tell you the truth, Barbara, I don't even have to make them aware that what they're going through is a problem because most of them are not, they don't come into my office voluntarily. They are dragged in by their wife or their partner who's saying, he's watching porn. I don't like it. I think it's disrespectful of me. He wants me to do what he's seeing in those movies. I don't want to do that. I think it's degrading. So I already have that going. But in many cases, the person will say, I don't understand. What's wrong with porn? These women who are engaged in porn, they want to be there. They're making money. They're happy. And then I go to this little story. Okay, if you believe that, if you believe that the women who are engaged in porn are doing that because that was their career choice, tell me about that 12-year-old that girl you met who, when you said to her, so what do you want to do when you grow up? And she said, well, I'm thinking of taking my clothes off in front of a camera and having sex with strange men and women. Where did you meet her? And of course, Barbara, in all the years I've been doing this, no one's ever been able to tell me about meeting that little girl. But I'll say this. I think some of those little girls out there exist. But the reason they exist is because someone or someones have hurt them very, very badly. And their self-worth and their self-esteem is shattered and they feel like an object they don't feel like a person so that part of what i try to communicate to men there are victims in part of pornography not all of it there are some women who again you know ooh, the money looks good i think i'll go do it but then again you go back and you read their stories and they're horror stories they mm -hmm. wish they had never done it. The, and especially what we're seeing with the trend of pornography now. Pornography is not just these two people making love together. What we're seeing, the trend, it is becoming extremely violent, degrading, and humiliating to women. That's the trend in pornography. And is that is that because once you're is that because of that dopamine or the stim that you kind of need to keep upping the game well, sort of or is it just a cultural degeneration? Well, the the the, 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 the the trend of increasing uh, pornography toward violence is about our society, and it is because like you look at uh, there was a quote from a. Uh, guy who was a producer in pornography. I read it about three years ago. I think it was on Fight the New Drug website. And what he said is something they have to question. Why is 
pornography so violent and degrading toward women. He goes, we're just giving men what they ask for. So therefore, that's telling you that there is a trend. Now, what you were just talking about deals with tolerance. So therefore, if I start out and I'm just looking at pictures of nude women, after a period of time, that no longer does anything. It's not stimulating because the dopamine has reached the tolerance level. So therefore, what I need to do is look into a new genre of pornography. And then that keeps escalating over and over and over so that you are now looking at things that one, nobody should even be doing, never mind looking at it, okay? Because it is so degrading to other people. But yet, that is the thing that we are looking at at times. So, so those that that part again, that part of the whole thing with pornography, it escalates. The other issue with pornography, though, is that you look at right now the number of young men, because again, young a boy but looking at pornography as young as eight and ten, they start. We're looking right now, we're seeing young men. 18 to 22, 23 year olds who are struggling with erectile dysfunction because of their chronic masturbation and use of pornography. That when they do finally meet someone and they're going to be sexual, they're having performance issues. We never saw that before. We, that was really unheard of. It was usually men 50 plus. Yeah. This is it. They're popping Viagra, young men are popping Viagra because they cannot get an erection because they've trained their brain. They need a certain level of stimulation. The other thing that they're doing is when they're having sex with a woman, they're not having sex with the woman. They're playing a porn scene in their head to keep them aroused. Right. Yes, I could. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I see that. Um, and I'm sure that, uh, of course, a woman can sense that if her, if her senses, her heart is open, it's going to be trans, tra uh, uh, funny word, transmitted, uh, the feeling the and, and it's something that you can sense. And it's, yes, so you're missing can. out on, on an intimate, vulnerable, real love connection. That's right. the loss, correct? But, but that goes back to the emotionally undeveloped person who doesn't bring emotional intimacy into the sexual act they just bring physical intimacy into it because that's what it is it's just sex right okay it is not love making it is not bonding it is just sex and i'll tell you a quick little story that i only heard uh last week one of my peers was telling me uh they it was a young woman that she was working with and the woman's about uh i think about 19 and she started dating someone who was about 18 and they after about six months they decided to have sex and this was her first time and they're having sex and midway through he starts choking her they're choking her and slapping her and she's like flabbergasted and she pushes him off her and she goes off locks herself in the bathroom he's standing outside and saying what's wrong what's wrong and she goes what do you mean you tried to choke me you tried to kill me he goes, no i didn't he goes i was just doing what i saw with pornography you like that don't you doesn't that all women like that they like they want to be treated that way and that, but that goes to show the society that we're trying to, that we're creating now because of pornography. Mm -hmm. It's very, it's, it's a very, it's very prevalent. It's a very serious problem. And there's a lot of confusion around this issue and a lot of outcomes like what you're just, what you're saying um, happens. It's just a lot of confusion. Um, one, one point I wanted to clarify, because you've mentioned it a few times with pornography objectifying humans objectifying women i guess when you objectify some something anything a, a human a woman then anything goes like that i remember learning about that when in university with the concept of rape if you objectify someone 
they they you they lose their humanity and you can do anything to them. Oh, that's what I said before. They're objects. They're not people. Mm-hmm. That's it. You look at if you look at them as objects, right? You you are more willing or more likely to engage in things with them that you wouldn't if you did see them as a person. Mm-hmm. So yes, absolutely. And again, that's that's what we're teaching little boys now. Teaching them to see objects. Little girls are nothing more than objects. And like I said, worse yet, we're teaching little girls it's okay to be an object. And that's really sad. And I it is, it's it's really sad, really, really sad. And um, of course. The other flip side of the coin is the accessibility is so much more now with our iPhones and sites like Pornhub that you can Google up right before you go to sleep. So there's so it's so accessible to to everyone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there, there are efforts being made and they're very, very slow to put in an age verification system where people would have to put in an ID and a credit card and all of this information in order to go to any type of porn site. The UK uh, thought they were going to be able to implement this early last year, but they were having all kinds of technical problems with it and it didn't work. There have been some rumbling here in the U.S., about doing it, but nobody seemed to really think it's a very serious problem to take hold of it. And I do believe it is Australia, it's either Australia or Austria, can't remember, but one of those countries is now in the process of putting that together for the first time. So we're hoping, because all we need is one country to do it, and I think the rest will just start to fall like dominoes. And therefore, and so therefore, what we do is we will limit the accessibility to people under the age of 18. That will be helpful because therefore we won't be polluting the minds of these young kids at such a tender age. Of course, because their minds are still developing. Yeah, until our mid-20s, right? As you were telling me this, the one message I, I kept kind of thinking was that there's a lot a high there's a lot of money in this. There's a lot of profit to be made. It's a big money making business, and I just wanted to. It's point a bulky. It's a bulky billion. That's a B billion dollar industry, and yes, and I think that is part of the reason why we're not seeing a lot of change in trying to make the system more safe for our young children. Because I think a lot of people are, their pockets are being lined by these corporations that hide under these fancy names. Like you know, you, you, you know, you mentioned porn hub, which is one of the largest, but if you go, there's no porn hub corporation. You know, they're, they're under other corporation names that people wouldn't even know that, you know, that that is Pornhub. So, yes, there's the money trails are, are pretty stag- uh, staggering. Yes. Yes, they are. So where would be the very best place to move this conversation forward from your perspective? Well, I think um, the idea that talking about, you know, what can people do when, you know, they realize, okay, I, I'm struggling with this sexual addiction, this pornography addiction. And I think first and foremost is you need to go and find someone who understands it. Uh, to, to work with a person who doesn't really have the background of what this is about, it could be very limiting in them getting the proper treatment they need. So it's finding that skilled coach or counselor who've been through all of this. But then also there's the need for community. There, there's a big need for community. You cannot you can't fight any addiction 
by yourself. The lone wolf will fail. Uh, that's why, you know, AA is so popular, okay? But then we have things like SA, sexual, sex anonymous for, you know, people with sex addiction. We have food, you know, for, for we have the group for people who have eating disorders and for all other disorders. You need to be in community with people because ultimately what's really going on when it comes to the pornography or sexual addiction See, people are looking for a connection. And like you mentioned before, you said, yeah, it seems like they're just focused more on the physical part of it. True, because they don't know what they don't know. And that is, oh, there's an emotional part of relationship. And so, but that's what they're really seeking. Porn addiction, sex addiction is an intimacy disorder. We are looking for emotional connection. What we did, though, instead, if we build the foundation of a relationship on physical intimacy and we'll sprinkle some little bit of emotional intimacy in to try to make it feel like it's legitimate. But that's not the way relationships are supposed to be designed. They're supposed to be based on emotional intimacy and we sprinkle in the physical intimacy to reinforce it. So they also need to understand about what is healthy sexuality. You know, it is about helping each other, helping the couple to bond and grow together. So that's, you know, another aspect that we need to look at. And then when they get into their therapy and they start breaking it down and saying, okay, so what are those childhood pain points that are still haunting me today? Understanding those, understanding what are the core emotional triggers that activate your child, and then being able to slow everything down when you get triggered to be able to walk through and move away from emotionally based thinking to rational thinking. So therefore then, as I said before, you can make the right choice, the healthy choice. Hmm. Wow, that's fair. I mean, it's just kind of uh, blowing my mind here. I mean, a lot <laughs> of us are really emotionally driven and very emotional beings. But we need to be balanced to get to a rational place where we can think through this and slow down so that our triggers are not destroying our lives or affecting our choice making process. Is that right? Right. But again, if you have, if you're raised in an environment where nobody's walking you through those steps of emotional development, okay, then I'm going to come out at the back end being that emotionally, you know, voided person. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to be that, but I still want connection, Barbara. So how do I get the connection? I get it physically. That, right. That's the only thing I know what to do at that point. <laughs> A positive intention, perhaps. Yes, positive yes. with major serious consequences. Mm -hmm. Well said, well said. Um, yeah, I, I just generally notice a lot of confusion around what intimacy is. And as long as we're addicted, we can't, we can't be emotionally available and experience loving bonds and intimacy. Right, Dr. That, Eddie? <laughs> that, that You are absolutely right. We can't. Because what are we doing when we're, when we're trapped in those addictions? We're running away from anything that is emotional. Okay, because one, what do we run away? We're running away from any emotional pain, yet it's emotional pain that helps us to grow. Okay. And two, I don't know how to cultivate a healthy emotional relationship. So therefore, what I'll do is I will try to turn it as to physical as quickly as possible that I could feel there's a sense of bonding because those who are addicted, they never feel more loved than when someone is being physical with them. And they will show someone how much they love and care for them by being physical with them. So again, what's missing? The emotional component. 
at some point, the person who doesn't have the addiction start to feel used as they start to feel like, hey, there's something wrong here. This is good. The only time you come near me is if you want to be sexual with me. And if I try to come to you because I want comforting, I just want to put my head on your shoulders and just relax, you know, you're, again, you start turning it into sex. So I can't even come to you to try to get emotional comfort because I have to worry that you're, again, going to want to engage in a sexual activity. Yes, that that does make a person feel used and um, unsafe. Right. And, and, once, and once people feel unsafe, there is no relationship. It's not there. Right? Exactly. Exactly. We need that relationship container to be a safe, safe place. Correct. Right. So there, you could see from what we've been talking about, there are a lot of moving parts that play into any addiction and, and the, uh, the void or the, the emotional vacuum that is not connected to all of it. So therefore, there are a lot of different pieces that have to be worked upon when you are trying to get a person to become complete because they're not complete without that emotional core. Yeah. There's some holes in the core. There's some holes in the core of that person. Oh, um, your truth. I bet some people don't even have the core. Okay. I mean, it, it's not frightening. And that's very true. That is that. Wow. I mean, I think we've hit on some really powerful, powerful points. Yeah. Some, some of us don't even have the core and some of us have holes in our core that, that like our core is like Swiss cheese, but through this inner child recovery process, we can, we can begin to heal. Healing is, is possible. Absolutely. There's no doubt about it. It is possible. If I learn again, what are those unresolved childhood pain points? What activate them? How to sit with those, okay? How to sit with that pain and then move it from the emotional pain to rational thinking. See, what, what have we done in all of this? We've slowed everything down. People who have addictions are compulsive. They don't slow anything down. People who have addictions are not mindful. They slow nothing down. We have to be able to slow everything down. So that's the speed bump. That's the speed bump. Because remember I said before, the, tr the kid gets triggered. All right. You now are feeling this emotional intensity, discomfort. That's where we run. With the inner child model, we now say, no, we're not running. We're going to sit. We're going to process what the pain is. Understand it's not going to kill you. You're going <laughs> to be okay. And then we're going to move to, all right, rational thinking. Here it is. What, what, what's really going on? And then we go to making the healthy choice. So we've added three more steps in to help people learn how to manage their addictive behavior. Because remember, we're dealing with addictive brains. The addictive brain is going to be there. You have to learn how to manage it. Mm. Wow. Manage it with strategies. Wow. Mm. That's right. That's what we're using. Just like that we use coping strategies to help us not deal with any of this. <laughs> so now what I've done is I just turned it around and said, no, 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 we're going to use coping strategies that going to help us manage it. So that's exactly right. Hmm. I actually have to reference my sheet here and see, you know, um, Okay, so off the wall question, um, I'm sure it'll take us back to the path, but do men, and I keep saying men, um, but it seems like it seems like it, 
do men lie when they have sexual addictions or porno <laughs> and pornography addictions? You know, Barbara, what you just hit on is that is the worst part. The worst part about a person having a sexual or or pornography addiction is that they are deceitful and they lie. And that lying crushes the spouse or the partner more than any of the acting out ever did. Because what will happen is they get caught and first it's deny, 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 deny. They're shown evidence, and it's like, well, okay, but it was just that. Are you sure? Yeah, that's it. There was nothing more. And then, of course, and, and, and once that happens, women are so good at putting on their Sherlock Holmes cap and doing <laughs> the de- and doing the detective work. I mean, they drill in, and they come up with more and more and more. Well, what about this? Oh, that's what, yeah, you know what? I forgot about that. Well, then, I mean, you must have been doing it. No, 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 you're crazy. I would never do that. I would never even think about stepping out. Oh, but later on, I find more. Oh, well, so we call that the, the trickle truth, okay? The trickle disclosure. And it drives women crazy because one, why would you not just be honest with me? Why won't they be honest? Because again, emotionally undeveloped men, I'm going to be in trouble. I don't want to be in trouble. So I'm going to limit as much as I can how much I disclose. And eventually it comes out. But even when it all comes out, it leaves the spouse thinking, but is there more I didn't find? Right. What did I not find? And that's it. And I'm telling you, every woman who's been betrayed will tell you that the, uh, the forget the infidelity aspect of it. It is more about the fact that they've been deceived and they've been lied to and they've been gaslit. That is more troubling than anything else. Because if I can't trust you, we have no relationship. Absolutely. That's true. Um, But if a man had not cheated on you, but was engaging in watching pornography, do women generally feel cheated on just by the act of the gaze? I don't, I don't know the actual percentage of women who do. There are some women who don't. Some women are like, fine, go watch porn. I don't care. You know, that's great. Most of those women, they struggle too with being emotionally undeveloped, okay? They, they, they also don't under, quite understand all the intimacy aspect. Not, not all, some, but there is a large segment of women who look at pornography and say, that is infidelity because your eyes should be on me. They shouldn't be on anyone else. And, you know, and your, your need for sexual desire should be me and not anyone else. And remember, what we're doing, if we're teaching with pornography, it's okay to objectify. So now they're out with their wives or their partners, and their eyes are scanning all over the place. And women, again, to your point, you pick it up. And it's like, and so what it does, it makes women feel, what's wrong with me? Why am I not good enough for you? Oh, or you want something else. You want something different than what I can give you. And so what it does is start to work and in eroding their own self-worth. Yeah, there's a lot of parts to this moving train. Exactly. But there is something very soul crushing about pornography and how it comes alive in in between a couple yeah yeah it's it there's there's not a lot of gifts back um, no there's really not i mean again again because you know it serves as a a barrier between the two because what it does is going to wind up limiting the emotional connection that if any that they could have because i mean like we said before 
you know, how engaging is it for a couple to, you know, be involved in sex and his mind is playing the scene from a pornography movie. Mm -hmm. That woman, then she's like, what am I? I'm just the vessel. I'm just the vessel now. We're not, we're not bonding. You're using me. Exactly. That's so true. And, and that opportunity, because when, when you do have sex with someone, you do bond with them. Right. Bond um, there. And hopefully it's a love bond. Yes, exactly. But I mean, that, that is sex is for what? The development, creation of children and for, for a couple to bond together. Take your emotional intimacy and strengthen it through physical intimacy. That's what it's supposed to be. Well, but if you make it a physical act and that's all it is. Yeah, it's so um, it seems so there. It seems so basic what, what you just said, like everyone should know this, but we actually don't. And there's such a mass mass confusion around all of this in our culture in our society. Um, That's why I thank people like you for giving me an opportunity to come out and talk about it, that maybe we can educate some people and continue to grow the message of, you know, what you're doing, why you may think there's no ramifications to it. There mm -hmm. are lots of ramifications. There's lots of consequences. Yeah, exactly. And I would imagine, um, I've certainly blushed a few times, but is there a lot of, maybe this is different, but is there a lot of shame around this topic that oh. we speak freely about it? Yeah, there is a lot of shame with it. You know, people who are watching pornography, although I think it may be changing among the younger people, you know, those people who are, you know, in the age of between 15 and maybe in their mid 20s, I think they're more open to talk about porn, many times in a joking way. They do it, you can't do it, but underneath is there. But for the, for the majority, people who are watching pornography, they're not doing it in public. And they're certainly not going out and telling people about it. Okay. They're, they're keeping it to themselves. And that's the other aspect it's isolating. It's an isolating thing. It's not like it keeps you from getting out and doing other things because, no, I think I'd rather just stay on what porn right now. So, so that becomes another consequence with it. But yes, shame is a major issue that we have to deal with, especially after someone's been caught and we've taken that behavior out of the dark and we put it into the light. So oh. now they're sitting with it and I have to try to, because shame, I think is like the biggest deterrent be, that between helping a man get healthy because you'll keep collapsing. And if you keep collapsing because of the shame, emotionally and mentally, he'll want to run off memory. He doesn't want to sit with the pain. I don't want to sit with the shame. So now he runs off. So that's why I got to work to say, no, 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 we're, we're moving away from that shame. And therefore, you're going to sit with this. Say, yeah, you're right. It was not the right thing to do. Shouldn't have done it. But I don't have to do it for the rest of my life. I can feel guilty, but I don't have to feel shameful. And that's why I want to show them why. That for me, the big question, why does sex have a stronghold on your life? It's not just that, it's not that you're a pervert. It's the fact that you have unresolved childhood pain points that you're not aware of, but that they cause you, you wind up getting affected by them because you get triggered and you won't sit with that emotional pain. So I have to teach them how to sit with the pain so that they can now manage the addiction. What an incredible legacy work. This is very important work. Yeah, sitting, sitting, sitting with your pain. That is a something that's really come through loud and clear in this, this conversation. An hour always goes by really fast. I'd love to give you the opportunity to just share a healing truth or any any last words of wisdom that you'd like to like to put out there into this uh, beautiful world we live in. 
Yeah, I, th I think it's to be true to yourself. You know, we're not true to ourselves. You know, we're true to whatever we think everyone around us wants us to project. And with that, again, comes a lot of emotional and mental distress because we're not who we really should be. And we need to start to remove the facade and we need to be able to understand, you know what, this is who I am, accept me, don't accept me, and then be able to move on. Because what we're going to do, we're going to find a lot more peace with that than if we continue to hide ourselves behind masks. And we find peace and we beautiful, yeah, behind the masks and the facades. And we find a lot more personal agency and our own personal power. Or, indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Yes. Wow. I'm blown away. I, I, I'd love to talk more and have you on again because this is such a such an important topic. I'm yeah, I'd, love, I'd love to come back. Beautiful. I'm excited because you're going to give away one of your books. Yes. Uh, to our audience. Do would you like yes. to, yeah, the title of it again? It is Going Deeper, How the Inner Child Impacts Your Sexual Addiction. Mm. In fact, yeah. they could have one or the other. They could have that one or they could have, if they want, the new book, which is Why Men Struggle to Love. So either or. And it's amazing. That's an amazing offering. Thank you. And we're going to do a social media draw for that. And if anyone out there would like to connect with you and reach reach out to you, how might they do that? Yeah, they can want to go to the website, the Inner Child website, which is www.innerchild-sexaddiction.com. Again, innerchild-sexaddiction.com. Uh, or they can reach out to me at Ed Kappa, E D. C A P P A at gmail.com. I'm not taking new clients. I, I've been overbooked for a long time. However, I've trained a network of clinicians on the inner child model. So if people were to reach out to me, I'll be able to send them a referral so that they can get the help they need. Right. And I remember you said getting that specialized, that specialized help is important. So that's right. it is. It is. Yes. And just want to underscore that you also have two incredible blog sites, menagainstporn.com and sexuallypuremen.com. Right. That's so correct. Two other I think I think I think the other one, I think it's menagainstporn.org. I'm not sure, but it might be org if they check that one. Okay, beautiful. And they, they'll also be on your website. So to everyone joining us today, thank you for being courageous. Thank you for believing in healing. I ask uh, I ask you to subscribe to my YouTube channel. And if you want to collaborate or connect with me, you can always find me at barbaralapoint.com. That's all we have time for today on the Healing Broken Families podcast. Uh, I invite you to be well and be blessed. Until next time. for supporting the Healing Broken Families podcast and being part of this amazing healing community. I'm Barbara LaPointe, a solution-focused life coach, divorce coach, and conflict resolution specialist. But I am so passionate about your awakening. I am passionate and so excited to welcome you to your own divorce awakening to your own spiritual and soul awakening because all is well you know what we are empowered to heal we are empowered to heal and your divorce difficult high conflict relationship parental alienation all of these things 
will, you will come to see them as a gift. You will come to see everything as a beautiful gift. So embrace the conflict, embrace the struggle, embrace the, the wound. I invite you now to please go to my website, arbillapoint.com. There are many free resources there for you, but a great place to start is download my ebook, Erased by a Narcissist, um, and then book yourself a free complimentary consult or connection discovery call. I will serve and coach you powerfully for an hour. Also, I invite you now to subscribe to my YouTube channel, make comments on these videos. I ask all of my expert guests to make themselves available to you and also comment your questions, your pain, your problems, and your, your thoughts, your opinions, your concerns. I truly, truly believe that we heal in community and um, I welcome you to my community. So I'm sending you a lot of love and blessings. I've come to know that when you go through divorce, you truly need to be resourceful, strong, um, and supported. So um, it's an honor to walk this journey with you. Welcome to your awakening and welcome to your deepest, deepest healing.